Okay, so today <coughs> will be uh, the kind of roundup of the general uh, part about moduli spaces. So we will give the precise definitions of fine and coarse moduli spaces. And then we will also show why fine moduli spaces don't always exist. So this will cover most of the time today. We will see an example of elliptic curves. We will do several uh, other examples. And uh, once we are through with this, we will switch the pace and we go really to our second subject, which are endpoints on the projective line. Uh, I will start with this next week. And then we will be uh, doing many pictures, drawings, graphs, and uh, also concrete proofs. So one thing I was wondering, if uh, one of you is interested to program a little bit about phylogenetic trees. So in the class, I'm only talking about, uh, about endpoints on the projective line. But one could also think about endpoints in the projective plane, okay? which is, in some sense, more interesting. Maybe at the end of the course, we will come to this topic. Because whenever you have points in the plane, you have more geometric uh, properties to be fulfilled by an automorphism. So for instance, collinear points will always go to collinear points under an automorphism of P2. So you have the concept of collinearity, not only coalescing points, but also points which are in general position may end up in the limit on the line. And this will give you a different geometric feature. So as for the endpoints on the line, where we will define phylogenetic trees and study them to understand the moduli space, there's also a kind of graph for endpoints on the plane. We call this graph the kite graph, because sometimes it has the shape, or parts of it have the shape of a, maybe a deltoid, or parallelogram, or what you call a kite. So we, have a, we did a couple of experiments with these kite graphs, and we observed a funny property uh, which I'm not going to explain now. We saw it in all examples, but we have no reason why this property is always satisfied. It's a very peculiar property satisfied by these graphs. So our goal is to understand why this is like this, but for this we would need more experimental material. So if some of you is interested first to understand the problem, you have to understand the background the mathematical background, but then also to, to classify all possible configurations of these graphs, and then to do a kind of list of, you have all the, the orbits of your group actions, and on the other side you have these kite graphs and you would have to make drawings. So if somebody of you is interested, I can even uh, provide a, a short-term contract for this we will discuss it. Just send me an email if you are interested, and uh, then we will see if it can work out. Okay. So thank you for joining us today, and we will start. So I think today we change our color. We go to blue. So the definition of moduli spaces. Of course. We have talked about them several times and been more or less precise, but today I, I want to, be, to present everything again in an organized way and complete way. So maybe this pen does not work very well, as I just realized. So let me try and then we will see. So let C be a category with fiber products and a terminal object. But I am not going to think of such a general object, general category. We will immediately pass to 
think of top, the topological vector spaces and continuous maps in between them. Or you may take C infinite manifolds with differentiable maps between them. Or <clears throat> you may take a complex analytic manifolds with holomorphic maps in between. Or you may think of algebraic varieties, let's say, over the complex numbers and morphisms. So algebraic morphisms, biregular or regular maps and morphisms. So there is one problem with the, I think, I think that's not, blue is not very good. Yeah, it's, it's kind of fading out. Now I go to yellow. So there's one point here where you should observe that the fiber product does not exist in the category of manifolds. So you have to take care that whenever you take a fiber product, it is really defined. Yeah? But I skip this detail. The, the, main, the main context will be algebraic varieties and regular maps or rational maps between them. But I don't want to presuppose that you know anything about algebraic varieties. Okay. So <clears throat> once we have such a category, this gives us, as we have seen several times, the notion of family in C as a map and to be more precise, a morphism x to t. So t is a base space x is a total space, both in C. And then, as you remember, we have an extra requirement that the fibers belong to a certain class of objects. With fibers xt in a certain class of objects, P of C. So <clears throat> if you take algebraic varieties for your category C, you could take for P, for instance, smooth curves. Okay? Smooth curves, or what is equivalent to them if they are compact. If you take projective smooth curves, equivalent to, say, Riemann surfaces. Okay? So that's the setting. Then we also have, on the object of C, we have an equivalence relation. Let further be given an equivalence relation on the objects of C. And of course, typically, isomorphism and whenever we have an equivalence on the object we also get an equivalence which I already described on the families inducing an equivalence relation between families Okay. Is it okay for reading? So I realize that the, the, the colors only appear once the, they are drying, but uh, I hope you can read well. Okay. Read it very well. Thank you. Perfect. So now we will define, so I want to do it in the functorial way, my definitions, but you can always think of the concrete situations. So we obtain, obtain a functor f, which goes from c 
to the category of sets. So if you're not familiar with functor, I think everybody is, but if you're not, then it's just a way of expressing natural constructions. We will see it in the precise situation. There's nothing harmful to functors. Yeah. We obtain a functor f from c to z. And how does this work? Sending an object t of c to the z of equivalence classes of families x to t. OK, I repeat, we take a, a space t, algebraic variety. We look at all families with base space t. We take them up to equivalence, and this will describe a set, yeah, set of these equivalence classes. So a functor is given by sending objects to something. Here they are sets. And then we also have to say what happens to the morphisms and associating to a morphism S T of C. So if we have <coughs> such a morphism, we associate to it the pullback of our families, the pullbacks of x t by alpha, say, so this will be a commutative diagram. We have x to t. Here we have alpha. Here we have s. And here we have y going down to s. Here we have, again, the induced map, where y is x times s over t, the fiber product. So of course, I don't, I don't indicate here notationally the equivalence classes. Yeah, we, that's all, what you always do. You just choose representatives. So what does this, the alpha, is sending a family here, x over t, to a family over s. Okay, So that's a map in the morphism in the category sets here. Okay, That's our functor. And let me, let me say again, caution with many folds. But if you, if you feel fine with algebraic variety, then we are on the safe side. OK. So now the definition of a fine moduli space is quite simple. Definition. So the moduli space should belong again to our category C. And it is an object in C. So an object, or if you want a space or a variety, M in C is a fine moduli space uh, for the functor f. And one kind of saying is also for the moduli problem defined by f. So now I, I start with the categorical definition, and then I make this, uh, pull this down to earth so that you see what's going on. <clears throat> if, so that's a Grotendieck terminology, f can be presented by m. So that's a terminology which sounds very abstract, but there's not so much behind. This means there is 
an isomorphism of functors. So you represent f as the functor given by the morphisms in C, where you, the variable is the first space, the first object, and the second one is m. OK? So that's how you find it in the literature. No? Bomb. Yeah? And of course, all the authors are convinced that you know what it means to present a functor. OK? So what does this mean? Hmm. So now, if you are not so, if you don't feel comfortable with functors and isomorphisms of functors, uh, let me first describe it heuristically, and then I will put it, uh, express it in very precise terms. So this functor, as we have seen before, this f here. Sends each t, every t, t, every space t is sent to the family equivalence classes of families x over t, and it also applies to maps alpha from s to t. So this means that if you take here f of t, then this is the same as taking a morphism from t to m. I repeat, taking an object t and applying f to it. Okay, so this means. Applying f to it means to consider equivalence classes of families x over t. That's the same in a precise sense as taking a morphism from t to m. That's something we have seen already. Okay, It's just now formulated in terms of categories. And moreover, if you now apply your functor f to the morphism alpha, then you get also here a morphism on the side of, of M. Okay. So <clears throat> if you want to, yeah, I actually, I would like to, to love to give you a, a very good reference on this. But there are two types of references, either those which are very technical and high flown, and the other ones which are intuitive but often not precise. So I'm kind of in between. I don't have the optimal uh, reference yet, but this uh, here I follow essentially Harris and Morrison. I think you, you have seen the bibliography on the website. So that's a whole book uh, on moduli of curves. And they do it for schemes, but you can always replace schemes by varieties if you want. OK. So I think I don't need this here anymore. I'm during the week. I'm thinking of how this cleaning could be uh, improved because it does not. First, it takes a lot of time, and it it does not really work well. But for this class, we will live for this course. We will live with it. Yes, just a second. Yes, please. No, no, no. So uh, you have the set, the set of all families, equivalence classes of families, is sent by the image of alpha to the set of all families over S, induced by pullback. Uh, so maybe uh, 
let me put it here, well defined. I can, I, I don't want to explain it now, but I think it's, it does make sense. Uh, I can send it to you in the in email afterwards, but these technical details I want to skip them here. Yeah, but it it is a, a morphism in sets. Yeah? It sends one set to another one, and the elements of these sets. Yeah, so it's a lot of terminology for expressing not so much. So let me write this down. What this means? Oh, I have a problem with my nodes. So now it comes now come a series of comments, so remarks. So the first one is as I said before, for all T objects we have <coughs> Ft will be the morphisms in C from T to M. So I write the equality, maybe I should say isomorphism. So this one was equivalence classes of families x to T. And here, so these are the elements. And here the elements are just, I don't know how to call them. Maybe I call them phi from t to m. But that's something we have seen already. No? Whenever we have an, a, a family, if you have a moduli space, we get a map yeah, from t to m. So how does this go? t goes to the equivalence class of xt as an element of our moduli space. Okay, I think I call this also m. m. If this here is f, I call this mf of t in the last lecture. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second remark is here we are talking about families, but we can always take for our object t just a point, uh, provided that our category has points. But of course, in the varieties, we just take a point. If t equal t is just a point, then x to t is just an object. Yeah? There's just one fiber, which is whole x is an object in C, and we take its equivalence class. Take its class. So this implies, from what we have seen before, that M, hence, the points of M are in bijection with equivalence classes. Sorry, this is an object. You should have corrected me. The, this is an object in P. Yes, our fibers are in P. P is the category of objects or the class of objects we want to classify under equivalence relations. So, is an object in P and the points of M equivalence classes or isomorphism classes, if you prefer, of objects in P. Okay, so you see that this framework with family contains, in particular, just to to collect the equivalence classes in one space. Okay. OK, number three, what else do we have? Now, now comes a trick. So you will, I am not very fond of doing category theory. 
But sometimes it's useful, this language. And here I will show you one application of this terminology. So uh, going backwards, going backwards, yeah? so instead of taking here a family, we can start with a morphism from t to m and then go to the family. Okay? Because there's a bijection between the two. So going backwards, we can choose here a very special morphism, namely, we take for t m itself. And taking t equals m, yeah, this is allowed because m is an object of our category, is an algebraic variety, maybe projective, I don't know what. Taking t equals m and the identity of m from m to m in more c m m. Yeah. So if we start with this information, we now get a family over m. We get a family which I call, I think I will call it pi, yes, from some huge space u down to m yeah, by this property. And of course, we can take again the equivalence classes. But how is this family defined? Yeah. It first, I give it a name called the universal family. for this moduli problem. So <clears throat> let me make this more explicit. That's a, a nice trick here. It formalizes what we have said in earlier lectures. and. Uh, not very complicated. So let me explain. So what does this do? I have to take a little bit of care. So if we take a point M in capital M or script M, let M in M be a point. Yeah? We are used to call the elements of a space points. Yeah, without giving it a meaning. If we have a point, then, as we have seen in number two here, it corresponds to an equivalence class of objects in C, in P. Corresponding to the equivalence class How do I want to call this equivalence class? I don't know if I want to call it. Ah, let me call it capital X of, I write it like this with brackets, of an object X in P. So what does this pi do? By definition of what we have seen above, then and that's the clue, pi inverse of m, pi inverse of m will be an object
in P, yeah, because uh, uh, by definition of our morphisms, will be an object in P. Uh, and its equivalence class is precisely M. This equivalence class. m equals x. So this property 3, this universal family, tells you that we can choose in a coherent way representatives for our equivalence classes. This means there is a, let me call it coherent way, and this means either continuous or algebraic, continuous, algebraic, analytic, and so on, way to choose for each. And now I call M an equivalence class, equivalence class M, a representative. Maybe I should call this here X sub M a representative xm in p. OK. Eric, yes. Uh, I wonder why uh, i minus 1 of m uh, is only one object. Couldn't it be a family of objects? No, no, no. So f of t is a family. So here we would have f of m, so it is a family over m, and the fibers here are objects. Yeah, yeah but here, down here, here, pi minus 1 could be uh, anything. No, pi. Could be uh, a family, not, not necessarily one, one object. No, but we, we agreed that whenever we have a, this is a family. And the families, the fibers of our families, are objects in P, by definition. Think about it. You, you have a, uh, I think you have a note in your thinking, but it's not difficult. Yeah, that's, it's really the, the pi inverse of M here. This one is an object in P. I have written it here. There's nothing behind it. It's just, uh, if you think five minutes about it, you will, you will see that there's nothing behind. It's easy, OK? Uh, I, often it's not good to explain in more detail because you won't understand better. But if you step back for a minute, then it will become clear. Thank you for asking, OK? So uh, number four, the naming universal family is justified. Of course, Riemann would have been very happy with all these definitions because it would formalize what he was thinking of. It's justified because any morphism t to m will induce a commutative diagram so here we have our universal family here we have t to m again we get let me call this v uh, this will be the pullback so v will be u times t over m So this, the fibers here, were the fibers, so now this was pi, let me call this tau of tau, are a universal choice. I don't define universal here. of representatives. 
So maybe I should formulate this differently because this might be a little bit confusing. What I want to say is that you get, in this way, you get all morphisms above t. Okay. So the statement of the, uni of the universal family, or the property of universal family, means that whenever you have a family or a morphism like this with fibers, objects in P, then they are induced by this universal family. Yeah? So here you have the largest family of all equivalence classes of objects in P. Yeah? And by base change, you get all other families. So that's what is called universal. There is also a notion of semi-universal, which I'm not going to define here. Yeah? There was also this discussion. Some of you asked me, what about deformations? So there's a principal difference between moduli spaces and deformations. In moduli spaces, the objects are global, projective varieties usually, or schemes. In deformation theory, the base spaces, T, are germs, germs usually of analytic varieties. So you consider your fibers only nearby the special fiber, whereas here everything is global over the base space. OK? Are you happy? <clears throat> now, the last property, uh, pa, 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 can you still read here? Oh, yeah. Can I add this here, number five? Then I don't have to erase. Let me see if you see this. Yes, you see this. So number five, we, get, uh, we also get uniqueness for any, and that's usually the meaning of universal. For any family x over t, there exists a unique base change uh, from t to m uh, inducing f to f from pi, as above here. Okay, So whenever you take, that's what I said already here, whenever you take an arbitrary family, you get it from the universal one by a base change. And the base change essentially means that you just change your parameter. Okay, You substitute the parameter by a function in the parameter. OK. So let me see. Yeah, I think I can continue a little bit before we go to the break. So that's the concept of fine moduli spaces. And uh, uh, that's a nice definition. The problem with it is that many, prob many moduli problems don't admit a fine moduli space. OK. Maybe yes. Another question is, um, did you use the property of categories having uh, terminal uh, elements? Ye uh, yes. Where, with this, uh, because, because I want to talk okay. about the fiber. So if I want to talk the, about the fiber over a point, I need the concept of point. And the concept of point is defined by the functor of points using the terminal or the initial object. Yeah? So if you have, for instance, if you have a topological space x, yeah? what is the point of x? Of course, it's just an element of x. But there's another way to characterize the point of a topological space x. You just take a map from the one point set, from the topological space consisting of one point, into the topological space. This map is uniquely given by choosing a point in x. And the idea of Grothendieck was to identify the points of this space x with the maps from the terminal or initial object into the space. OK? Let me write this down. So this is now a different remark. If x, you can do it for algebraic varieties or for schemes, but let me just do it for x 
a topological space, and P a point in X, an element of X, and we call it point, then you can also consider let I don't know how to call it. Let me draw it like this. Let this one be the unique topological space with one point, cardinality one. Okay. Then any so we don't have to talk about continuous because it's automatically continuous. Any map from this one point space to x is given by the choice, is uniquely given, given by the choice of a point p in x and conversely. Okay, that's what is often called the functor of points in algebraic geometry. Okay, and that's you need you need to have in your category such a space, which we call the terminal object or the initial object. Okay. So before the break, I uh, have to. I need more space. <clears throat> so as I already mentioned, uh, people uh, were trying to construct fine moduli spaces because that's the optimal answer you can have to your moduli problem. And they realized that they don't exist in many cases. You remember the remark of of Grotendieck I sent you, saying that he believes that the obstruction to get the fine moduli space are the automorphisms of your, in, of your object in P. So I write it down. In most cases of moduli problems, Fine moduli spaces do not exist inside C. No? Of course, you want your classifying space, your moduli space, to be in the same category where you're working in, algebraic varieties or schemes, typically. Okay? So, what do you do? There are three exit strategies. Exit one. And this is when something which is very often done if you work in the category of algebraic varieties or schemes. You extend C. Extend the category by allowing more general objects. Recall, our objects are spaces or algebraic varieties. So for algebraic varieties or schemes, there are two steps. Uh, one may pass to something which is called algebraic spaces. Which were introduced by Michael Artin. They are a generalization of varieties or to stacks. So this is Delin Mumford. And the reason for doing so is that 
when you quotient an algebraic variety by a group action, then you don't get again an algebraic variety. You get a more general object. And this is captured by the notion of, by the notion of stack. A stack is something which keeps track of how the group action is working on your algebraic variety. So this exit 1 is something we are not going to discuss in this class. Yeah. Exit 2. So exit 2 is, is so of course, exit 1 is already quite challenging. But exit 2 is kind of the opposite. You ask yourself, why? What is the reason which prohibits the existence of a fine moduli space? Yeah? And as I said several times, it seems, at first it seemed, and then it realized that this was really the problem, that the automorphisms of your objects in P, the automorphisms, so you take an object x in P, in your class of objects P, if this x has many automorphisms, then you have a problem. We will see an example in a moment. Now, what does it mean to have many automorphisms? This means to have a continuous family of automorphisms. If you have only finitely many more automorphisms, then it's still OK. And this finiteness of the group of automorphisms of your object in P, this is a concept which is called stability by Delin, Mumford, and Knudsen. Okay? So what you do if you have too many automorphisms on your Riemann surface, on your algebraic variety, you add extra structure. We have seen this already in the historical uh, exposition, how people try to, to enrich the structure of objects in P to rigidify the objects. Okay, So equip the objects in P with some extra structure. So as to eliminate, let me just call it infinite families of automorphisms. So finitely many are allowed. Many automorphisms will be allowed. And it will become clear why they don't bother us. So there are many, many attempts and proposals how to put some extra structure on your objects. So we mentioned already Teichmüller. Teichmüller did it in an analytic way. I will describe it again today in a different setting proposed by Bears. Uh, and uh, Delin Mumford did it in an algebraic way by adding either points on your curves or by taking curves which have many self-intersections. Okay. And the exit three. I have to hurry up. I have a lot of program. <clears throat> so you weaken your notion of fine moduli space. So uh, replace the isomorphism, which was between f and more c and m. Recall this was the definition of a fine moduli space by the existence of what is called a natural transformation between the two. So that's weaker than an isomorphism. But again, what does this mean?
Okay. So this will just requiring a natural transformation between these two functors will precisely define a coarse moduli space. Uh, I'm doing it in a moment, but first I want to explain what this means. So as again, for each family from x to t, we get a morphism t to m. So this will be preserved with, uh, let me call this f and this mf. MFT, the equivalence class of XT. We are already well aware of this. That's OK. Uh, but we don't have, as we don't have an isomorphism, we just require the following subject to the following compatibility. Ability condition. <clears throat> With respect to base change, to base change, for alpha from S to T, such a base change, and uh, Y to S another family the requirement is uh, so if this family is obtained by pullback obtained from F by pullback via alpha we have, and that's now weaker than uh, for fine moduli spaces. We just want that the map MF behaves well. So how, what does this mean? We have here, we have from T to M, we have MF. Here from S to T, we have alpha. But by construction, we have here MG no? because of the property. And we want that this is the same. So this means that mg is mf composed with alpha. That's the only thing we require here. So if we impose this condition, uh, it's easy to observe. We are, I just mentioned it. This does not determine m uniquely. This property does not make does not make M unique. So why <clears throat> taking any morphism I don't know how to call it, let me call it rho from M to another object m prime will give an m prime with the same property. Easy to see. That's just set theory. You just compose everything. So in order to make m unique, in order to make M unique, up to isomorphism, of course, up to isomorphism. And recall that our minimum requirement is always that the points of M are in bijection with the equivalence classes of object of P. Okay, that's the minimum we want. Yeah. In order to make M unique, we ask M to be, now again, this magic word, universal.
And I will explain it after raising the left hand side. So <clears throat> there are in, in colloquial language, universal means something containing everything. But in mathematics, uh, you are well familiar with universal properties. So you know, universal properties don't only ask for the existence of objects, but they also ask for the uniqueness of the maps associated to these objects. Mm -hmm. So the uniqueness is a substantial part of an object being universal. And that's what we do here. So what does this mean? We will collect it in a definition. So let me check how it goes. So let C, P, M be as above. We have F from C to sets moduli functor. with respect to p as before. Then an object m in c is a coarse moduli space for F or for this moduli problem, if we have two properties, as said before, there is a natural transformation of functors. If you don't feel comfortable with natural transformations, just look it up in Wikipedia. Uh, it's not very complicated. So mm -hmm. this goes from F again to more in C M. Next property, uh, yeah, I call this now chi. So our requirement is, uh, as I said before, the objects, the equivalence classes of objects in P should be characterized or parameterized by M. So chi induces a bijection between f of t with m. OK, so the points of m should be f of t. These are the objects, as uh, these are the, the families over a point. Yeah? These are just objects in p. Okay. Yes. Sorry, that's too much to uh, equivalence class. So I have to be more precise. Equivalence classes of objects in P. So that's, of course, what we want, as I said before. And then this universality is the following. Now I have to write a little bit for all M prime with natural transformation. If you have another one, let me call it zeta more c m prime. Now, this m should be kind of the most general object. There is, and now the uniqueness comes into play, there is a uni unique morphism. One just has to take care that the maps go in the correct directions, m to m prime, such that zeta 
equals uh, pi composed with chi, where uh, pi is maybe not a good name because I used it already. Let me call it triple pi. Where triple pi goes from more C M. It is just an induced map more C M prime is the natural transformation induced from M to M prime by composition. Now, whenever you have a, a map from M to M prime, you get a map between the morphisms as well, just by composing with this map here. Okay, So this makes this condition on uniqueness makes M unique up to isomorphism. OK. So how am I doing with my time? We have something like 25 minutes. So that was a kind of general framework. That's the course moduli space. And now what I want to do in the remaining part is to show you why the automorphisms make a problem to find fine moduli spaces. Okay. So I think I can erase all this. And we start from scratch. And I will do it uh, in the example of elliptic curves. First, because it's uh, very classical. Second, because it's also very beautiful and explicit. One can write down equations, and we will do it. Okay. Do you have any questions while I am cleaning? Let me repeat for those who came late. If somebody of you is interested to, to program and to think a little bit about generalizations of generalization of phylogenetic trees, things which we call kite graphs, please contact me, and I will explain you in more detail. So in some sense, this class is a preparation. This course is a preparation for the problem of studying points in the plane. Yeah? The moduli space of points in the plane, uh, of course, there are classical papers by Fulton, McPherson, Delin, Mumford, Knudsen. But apparently, an elementary approach is not found yet. And we have one proposal to do it motivated by our studies of endpoints in the line on the line so if somebody wants to collaborate on this please let me know but there is some uh, programming work so why let me call them inner but even though this is not the appropriate word why automorphisms of objects in P prohibit the existence of fine moduli spaces. And here, as I said before, you should add infinitely many. So we will do the example of elliptic curves. You don't have to know what an elliptic curve is. I will just write down the equation. 
So we take T equals A1, A1C, this is just the complex line to be in a very concrete setting. And then we look at P2 times A1. So this is the projective plane times the complex line. And inside, we will look at a zero set of a polynomial equation, which is given. Now, here we have three variables, which I will call x, y, and t. So maybe I should write the first two as projective coordinates. Okay. So we take the classic, one of the equations for elliptic curves is we take a very special one, x, x minus 1, x minus t. Okay, so we take the set of all points satisfying this equation. Very good. And uh, this maps down to t, sending x, y, <coughs> t to t. Okay. So we have a for each t we have an elliptic curve, provided the t must be different from yeah, zero or one. T. Because if you would have equal t equals zero or one, you would get a multiple factor here, and that's not allowed when you consider elliptic curves. So actually we are working on an open subset of A1. Now when are two such elliptic curves, so let me call this ET, the fibers, xt, et, so this is now the fiber over t, which is an elliptic curve. I'm cheating a little bit because an elliptic curve is not just the fiber, but it's also the choice of a point on it. So one should rather say this is a Riemann surface of genus 1. But let's not bother with these details, OK? So <clears throat> ET is, in this special example, and that's not an arbitrary elliptic curve, but we can always write it like this. So ET is isomorphic to another fiber. So that's very nice here in this example. You get the following condition. S must be one of the following values. Either it's equal to T, 1 minus T, 1 over T, T minus 1 over T. We had already this with lambda, and T over T minus 1. So that's here, what you see here are Möbius transformations. That's a subgroup. Uh, this here is a subgroup of Möbius transformation, isomorphic to S3. S3 is a permutation group of three elements. Okay, So you see precisely what happens here. Now, we have here a, a family. And we get, for six values of t, we get the same fiber. We get isomorphic fiber. For six values of t, and let me call it of s, we get isomorphic fibers, ET, yeah, these here, OK? Now, one can define the J invariant. And the J invariant will send, it can be defined directly. It is defined for the elliptic curve. But as the elliptic curve, in our example, is parameterized by T, we can express it in terms of T, so the J invariant.
will define a 6 to 1 map. So here we have taken a1 minus 0, 1 going to a1. Let me just write it. t goes to g, j of t. So that's the j invariant of et. So if you now take this a1, you get, of course, a coarse moduli space because it parameterizes elliptic curves. Hence, m equals a1, given by the j invariant, the space of j invariants is a coarse moduli space for elliptic curves. At least I suggest here that it parameterizes isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. Okay? The precise property has to be checked. Okay? But it's not a fine moduli space. It is not a fine moduli space. And what we'll do is the following. We will construct a family over T where all the fibers are isomorphic to each other. But if you go once around a circle, yeah, you get, uh, even though you have isomorphic fibers, if you take representatives of them, you don't get a trivial family. So let me make this precise. Yeah. So <clears throat> if this were the case, first I give you the general reason, and then I will make it precise. If this were the case, let u from to m be the associated universal family. And consider the induced diagram Here we have our family x over t. Here we have u going to m, which is a1, the line. And by the property of the universal family, there would exist a map here, making this diagram commutative. So let me call this map here f. OK. Yes. So here, this would be just the only choice is here the j. Yeah. We call that our family is defined like this, taking here this t as a parameter. So t goes to j of t. Now, where is the problem here? The problem is that I don't have space to write this down. Uh, maybe I can do it here. Excuse me. This is now my small blackboard. So what happens? As you move t here, yeah, what do I want to say? Sorry. Yes. Uh, if you take t equals 1 half, for t equals 1 half, we get here the equation 
we have e one half y square equals x x minus one x minus one half. I just do it for this special fiber, but you can do it for all others as well. We have this one with the following automorphism with automorphism. So you replace x and y, you send x to, I think, 1 minus x, yes. Sorry. You send it to 1 minus x. So if you replace x by 1 minus x, then you get here 1 minus x, here you get x, and here you get again, x minus 1 half up to sine. So this one will go to its negative. So you have to replace y by plus or minus i times y. Okay. So here you have an automorphism in the special fiber. And uh, now I'm unable to draw a picture. Uh, this automorphism uh, is in conflict with the picture here, OK? So that's not very uh, suggestive. So what do I do? I clean my blackboard, at least here. One over t minus one and three since they are here. One, two, three, four. Perfect. Thank you very much. Before I erase it, we also have one over one minus t. We need six, of course. Thank you. But now I have to erase it anyway, but it's at least corrected. Already the last time when I wrote it in with Landers, I forgot one. But I hope you apologize. 